And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, this is our Explore Lakes with New Hampshire Lakes webinar series. Um, you can see we do have a few great um, webinars coming up in the next few months. So please go to our website and check those out and register for those as well as the, tonight's webinar, which is going to be waterfowl on the lake, beautiful and sometimes problematic. We have Jessica Carloni joining us tonight from the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. Thank you again, Jessica, for being with us tonight. I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping things um, and just introduce ourselves and I'll turn it right over to Jessica to get started. Um, so we are going to have this be recorded. Uh, we do ask that you stay on mute um, and that you keep your cameras off for the duration of our webinar that helps with background noise as well as bandwidth to make sure we don't have any issues with the video. You can submit questions to us in the chat box during the webinar, um, depending on what size screen you're on, your um, taskbar will either be at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen. And right there where it says chat, you can type in a question. If for some reason during the um, presentation, maybe I might have an answer for you or uh, my co-host tonight, Gloria, uh, we can try to get that in there for you during the presentation, but more than likely we're gonna save those questions for Jessica at the end. Tomorrow you're gonna to receive an evaluation form from us um, via email. We do really appreciate getting any feedback you have for us on the presentation um, that does help us improve. Um, and we also wanna hear any future topics that you might wanna hear from us. And just a quick little bit about New Hampshire Lakes, if you're not familiar with us, um, we're the only publicly supported nonprofit uh, working for all of New Hampshire's 1000 lakes, and you can help us with our efforts at newhampshirelakes.org. And we want to keep all of our lakes clean and healthy for now in the future. Um, we work with partners, promote clean water policies and responsible use and inspire the public to care for our lakes because they are certainly under threat, um, as you probably do know. So they need us now more than ever. We are trying to accomplish that through our different programs. Um, right now, it's advocacy season. Um, so if you are interested in our advocacy work and want to lend your favorite lake of voice at the state house, you can reach out to Michelle Davis. She is our um, advocacy program manager. We also have our conservation programs, which most people are aware of. Um, those great people out at our boat ramps in the bright blue shirts doing our lake host program. Um, they are front line of defense against aquatic invasive species doing boat inspections. And we also have our Lake Smart program, um, which is something you can do from the comfort of your own home. You start with a little survey that you'll fill out online to see what kind of things you're doing on your property. And this is for all of us, not just lakefront property owners. Um, once you fill out that survey, you're gonna get a personalized response back to you with some tips that you can do um, to be even better for our lakes. And you can actually have someone from New Hampshire Lakes team come out and do uh, an inspection of your home. And if you get the Lake Smart Award, you get to hang that up on your property to show your, your neighbors. We also have our outreach program, which brings you our webinar series that you're hearing tonight. And we're very excited that we're going to be having an in-person Lakes Congress event again this year um, in June, June 2nd and 3rd. Uh, so registration for that will be opening up in just a couple weeks. I'm your host this evening, Erin Mastine. I'm the Outreach Coordinator, and we have Gloria Norcross joining us as well. She's the Conservation Program Assistant. And your expert presenter this evening, Jessica, thank you again for joining us. And I am going to stop sharing my screen so that you can start sharing yours, and we'll get right into it. Okay, thank you, Erin. <clears throat> All right, is that coming on okay? Can you see that? Muted myself there. Yes, I can. <laughs> I was like, oh God, is something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you, Erin, again for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking about some different waterfowl you may see out there on the lake, um, whether you live on it, if you're out there recreating. Um, and what the New Hampshire Fishing Game 
department does to monitor and manage those species. Um, so waterfowl are actually a certain family of birds with, which includes ducks, geese, and swans. Um, people think that um, loons are actually waterfowl and cormorants, but they're not. Um, waterfowl only include ducks, geese, and swans. There's almost 150 species worldwide, and they're sexually dimorphic typically, which just means um, in simple terms, you can tell the male from the female as in this green head male versus the brown drabby female, which we will talk about further. Um, navigation through migration routes, um, they all fly these through these corridors um, in different colors. And we learn these different migration routes through banding data and these really cool GPS tags that we now have employed on a lot of birds. Um, so they migrate usually from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds. And they use um, the sun and the stars, different landmarks um, on the landscape and magnetic fields to, to make their way to their breeding season. And they do this every, every year. So as you, could, as you would assume, that's, that's a very energetically costly to them. Um, it's a lot of energy flying from Florida to New Brunswick, for example. Um, so they have to have all these stopover points along the way where they can rest and recharge and be safe from predators. Um, so a lot of our lakes um, in New Hampshire are important staging areas for these birds as they migrate through. Um, so migration is really a, a tool for them um, that they've adapted, you know, to overcome limited food availability, um, cold and ice, different predatory concerns, and nesting in the spring. So really when the daylight hours start getting longer, um, they start getting antsy, like all of us. We want to get outside again and, and clean up our yards and go for hikes and go for paddles on the lakes. Um, these birds want to go and find their nesting area and find where they're going to breed and fly hundreds of miles to do so. Um, so most waterfowl are monogamous. Um, geese are monogamous for most of their life. Um, if they lose a mate, they will find a new one, um, but oftentimes they will stay with the same mate throughout their, throughout their life. Um, and males actually assist with raising the young, kind of different in the wildlife world. Usually males uh, do their thing and then they're, they leave the female alone for her to do all the work. So geese are nice in the sense that the males actually help raise the young. Um, waterfowl on the other hand are seasonal monogamy um, species. They form new pair bonds every winter. So the males that are brightly colored in the winter, um, you know, do a nice dance to attract females. And that's, so that happens annually. Um, we also have a little bit of polygamy happening in the waterfowl family. Uh, ruddy ducks and some other species not in North America um, are polygamous, which just basically means the males defend a territory and they mate with as many females as they can. Uh, reproduction typically lasts in waterfowl about the same time, um, 20 to 30 days. You can really say this isn't a duck species, but they get this brood patch um, and then they sit right on the eggs and, the, and that skin to egg contact really keeps the eggs nice and warm. Um, well, hens will lay one egg a day and then she won't sit on the nest till most of the clutch is hatched. And that's a strategy because she's on the ground and so she's susceptible to predators. And so she wants to delay sitting on the nest as long as possible. But obviously to, to have a successful clutch, she has to sit on the nest. So it's just a strategy to, to further um, promote her survival. So, um, Ducklings usually hatch in about 25 days on average in most waterfowl species. Um, ducklings, um, these cute little puff balls here, um, they're born and they can walk and feed themselves and they have feathers on them. So they're called precocial. Um, unlike, you know, a robin, for example, that's completely void of feathers and really relies on its mother for um, food and warmth and everything. So ducklings can just 
right off the bat, walk around and feed themselves and keep themselves warm for the most part. But basically everything will eat these cute little guys, unfortunately. Um, any hawk species, owls, frogs, um, great blue herons, turtles. So um, it's, it's the gauntlet for them really in the first two weeks of their life. If they make it past the first two weeks of life, their odds of surviving to fledge is, is higher and fledging just means that they can fly. So after three weeks, um, they just have down feathers and then after three weeks, they start to develop their flight feathers. So um, once they make it to that point, their odds of success are really good. Um, and then by late August, mostly all waterfowl uh, young of the year can, can fly at that point. Uh, waterfowl do molt in, in the year. Uh, swans and geese only do it one time a year. And they actually molt their flight feathers as well. So they're completely flightless during that time, making them vulnerable. Um, but ducks molt twice a year. So you can see this oftentimes beautiful wood duck that looks very drab and, and almost like he's sick, but he's not. He's just molting, molting his feathers um, to get new feathers to you know, last that migration and keep them warm and waterproof for the winter. And then of course, in the winter, they get into their beautiful um, breeding plumage so that they can attract a mate. Um, swans and geese are the largest member of the waterfowl family. Um, we don't have any native swans to New Hampshire. Um, and these species aren't, these um, geese and swans aren't sexually dimorphic. So the males and the females look the exact same. They all look like geese. <laughs> you can't be like, oh, that one, you know, like a, like a Drake Mallard, how you can tell that green head really stands out. So there's no sexual dimorphism in them. And swans eat mostly aquatic vegetation. Um, and geese really spend a lot of their time on this open grassland. So that's why they can be problematic, especially on, you know, people who live on the lake, because um, they have these expansive green lawns with open water, perfect habitat for geese. Um, a lot of people think mute swans are native to New Hampshire. They are not. They're not native to North America, actually. They were introduced um, by the Europeans upon European settlement. Um, they're very aggressive birds. They displace our native waterfowl. So they're really not good that they're, it's really not a good thing that they're here. Um, they eat a lot of vegetation a day um, on the bottom of the lake. They they, as they eat, they're using their feet and they expose the shoots and roots of a lot of plants that grow on the bottom, which um, damages them. And a lot of times they don't eat all the food that the, all the roots and stuff that they disturb. So um, a lot of it goes to waste and it just, it damages the habitat and um, they're very aggressive towards native waterfowl and push them away from their native habitat where they want to breed but oftentimes they don't because a mute swan is there. Um, Canada geese, everybody's favorite if you live on a lake. Um, we have resident populations as well as migrant populations. So resident birds really stay here all year long. During really um, rough winters, they will go a little further south into Massachusetts, for example, but all in intents and purposes, they are resident birds. We also get um, North Atlantic population geese that come down from the Maritimes Canada. So they come down really in October um, and then start coming back in March, March, April, right around now. So, so we have two populations of Canada geese. Um, dabbling ducks, you'll see a lot on lakes. And you really know it's a dabbling duck because you'll see their butts a lot in the air. Um, they do this thing called tipping up, which they, you know, dip down their head underwater um, to eat, you know, the shoots and stuff of aquatic plants, as well as there's a lot of little invertebrates down there that they really like. And another characteristic of them is they just kind of take right off the water. If you startle them, they can just, they have the ability to just take flight right off the water. Um, they don't need a running start like diving ducks. So we have a lot of dabbling ducks on lakes 
um, most of which aren't really abundant in New Hampshire. So I'm just gonna touch on the, the most abundant species. Uh, the mallard, obviously everybody knows the mallard. Um, hopefully everybody knows that the male um, has the green head with the white collar around his neck and the female is more cryptically colored. Um, that's a strategy for her to stay um, hidden, you know, cause she does nest on the ground. So she wants to be drab and, and kind of blend in with the environment on the ground when she does have a nest. Um, so they have this bluish speculum with white surrounding it. Um, so that's a characteristic of a mallard because there is another duck that looks very similar, but is lacking this white, white barring on the speculum, which is the American black duck, which is also a very beautiful duck. Um, I call them, if you see them on the distance, um, on a lake, I say black ducks look like dark chocolate and mallards look like milk chocolate. <laughs> it's kind of the best way I can describe it. Black ducks really look dark on the water versus, you know, a head mallard will look much lighter. Um, and they, both, they look very similar. You know, the male doesn't have a brightly colored head as in the mallard to decipher them apart. So um, the male just has a yellow bill and the female has an orange olive green bill. And so they also lack that white on the speculum. But underneath their wing, they have this very white flashy, which contrasts greatly from that dark body. So like I said, they're very similar to the hen mallard, as you can see here, two side by side, but just look at how dark that body of the black duck is versus the body of the hen mallard. And then, you know, the orange bill with the black saddle on the hen mallard versus the clear coloration, the same coloration of the bill on the black duck. And then the white barring of the speculum on the mallard and, and the lack of the white on the speculum in the, in the black duck. Wood ducks are absolutely beautiful ducks. Um, if you haven't seen them yet, you should try and seek them out. Um, they're a little more shy than a mallard duck. So it's very, you may not have seen one. <laughs> um, they like to eat acorns and they perch in trees a lot more because they have different webbed feet. Um, we have them coming into our backyard right now, which is really cool. They come and eat up. We have a little vernal pool in the backyard and they swim down every night and come up in the yard and eat all the acorns that the deer didn't get in the, in the fall. So it's really cool to see these guys. And another unique thing about them is they nest in cavities. So they don't nest on the ground like most other ducks. They nest in trees. Like if you had a limb on a tree break off and then that hole would decay over time and form this cavity, a wood duck would nest in there. Um, but oftentimes they nest in these duck boxes that we've put up all over the state um, to help them, um, you know, back in the 70s, 80s when, you know, our our forests were really young and still maturing from all the, all the clearing for sheep farming on uh, the 1900s. So they didn't really, they lost a lot of their natural habitat for nesting. So we put up a bunch of duck boxes all over the States to help these little guys. So it's really cool. Once, once the mom, once all the eggs hatch out, the mom does jumps down out of the box into the water and does this cool little call. And then all the little ducks climb up climb up the wall and they just take the plunge down into the water. It's really, really cool to see. Um, and then they all float away and she gets them undercover and in the scrubby shrub areas where she likes to take them to hide and they're really cute. Um, then we also have another group of ducks which are diving ducks. These, these type of ducks really eat more fish. So you see them a lot more on lakes with deeper water. Um, dabbling ducks like more shallowy type water. So you'll see them more along the shoreline of the lakes. Uh, diving ducks, you'll see all over the lake because um, they'll be diving down for fish. They have the ability to swim underwater and kick their feet. Their feet are placed very far back on their body, which helps them dive to catch fish. Um, but they do look funny when they try to take flight. They can't just take flight. They kind of got to get a running start um, in order to take off the water. Um, we also have a lot of species of diving ducks, some that just come through during migration and others that are here year round. 
Uh, these hooded mergansers actually breed here and similar to the wood ducks, they do utilize nest cavities to breed as well. So we often get these guys um, nesting in our duck boxes as well, which we're okay with. We like hooded mergansers as well. Um, so the male really has this cool um, big hood. So that's how they got their name. So he, you know, does this cool courtship dance where he really shows that off to try to get a female. And, you know, like in other waterfowl, the female is very drab colored versus the male. Common mergansers, they, these are very big birds. Um, can, not quite as big as a loon, but similar. Sometimes you'll see them off in the distance. You'd be like, oh, is this a, it's a loon? No, no, it's a merganser. But um, they're very cool too. Um, the female is, is more brown and drab and has this funky little hairstyle. Um, but they're very large body birds that you'll see in rivers and on lakes eating fish. So the red-breasted merganser is another diving duck species with an even more funky hairdo. Um, very spiked mohawk hairdo. Um, that serrated bill really lets you know that it eats fish, so it can chew up the little fish that it consumes. Ring-necked ducks are beautiful ducks, diving ducks that are actually moving through right now. You can see a lot on that, any really open water right now. Um, you're seeing these guys all over moving through on their way up to Quebec or Ontario where they nest um, for the summer. So it's really fun to see these guys right now. They're, they're very pretty. Um, sea ducks you don't often see on the lake too much, but every now and then you'll get a, get a glimpse of them. They're, they're very beautiful birds. Um, these are common eiders, um, which you'll see along the coast if you ever come down the coast. Um, these are surf scoters and these guys really specialize in eating shellfish and stuff. So that's why you don't see them all too much. Uh, they really prefer the mar marine lifestyle. So you don't see them too much in the lakes. Um, so just to explain a little bit how waterfowl are managed in the state of New Hampshire, obviously they're migratory. So, you know, it's, it's not like we can say we have X number of mallards in the state, like we can with deer. With deer, we can really tell you how many, you know, with varying confidence, how many we have on the landscape um, based on different surveys we conduct. But waterfowl don't know state boundaries. So they're really managed on a federal level. Um, so the North American Waterfowl Management Plan was this treaty-like um, contract with US and Canada, and then later Mexico joined in to protect um, migratory waterfowl and you know, enhance their habitats and try to stop them from being declined because you know before there wasn't any bag limits or season dates um, like a lot of our fur-bearing species and predators. You know, people were just taking as many as they wanted, so regulations started to come in and, and protect these species. So through those similar mi migratory corridors. Um, we developed these flyways across North America. There's four different flyways. So we're the, in the Atlantic flyway, which really encompasses all the Atlantic states and maritime Canada. And we learned that, we learned about the flyway and the migration corridors through the banding data, which is very important to us in waterfowl management. Um, so basically how we set the seasons each year is based on a federal framework and so that's how the hunting seasons are set each year for waterfall. Like I said, banding um, provides us a lot of information. Um, we can get population estimates for the whole flyway, um, migration patterns, how long they live, um, survival, productivity. And yeah, if you, see a, if you see a dead bird with a band on it, please report it um, to reportband.gov. Or if you're a hunter, um, you can go to that website and report it as well. Um, some, some bird watchers have spotting scopes and they can hone right in on a live bird. And if they're very patient, they can also get that number and report that as well. Um, so duck banding is very labor intensive, but again, we get so much data from it that um, it's very useful. So in August, we begin baiting them with corn. Um, and then, you know, we can set up tra trail cameras to try and monitor when they're coming in and pattern them. <clears throat> and then we can set up 
different, we have different techniques to actually trap them. So this is sort of a walk-in trap where it's basically the door is on a hinge and um, we just tie a fishing line over in the bushes. I'll be hiding in the bushes in pre-dawn hours. And then when I see a bunch of birds in the trap, I just cut the line and a bunch of ducks get caught on the trap and then we band it and we, we let them go. Um, another technique is rocket netting where we have um, three nets on this. This is a box with a net in it and it has three rockets on it with gunpowder in them. And so I'm typically hiding, um, but we have our camera guy with us today. So I'm hiding up in his truck and he's, he's got all these GoPros around. So this is a video, so I hope it works. So you'll be able to see. So I have a detonator up in the truck and this is the pile of corn here. So once all the birds start coming on, and I think that's as many birds are, is gonna hit the bait, then I can push a detonator, which then sends all three rockets over the ducks. And then I quickly run out and we all capture them. So let me just play this video here for you. So they're all starting to come in towards the bait. And a bunch are on there and no more are really coming through. So boom, the net goes off. And you know, we did have a bunch slip out the side here, but that's what happens. I mean, when, when you're capturing waterfowl, it's <laughs> it's you never know what you're gonna get sometimes. So you know, we just want a subsample. Um, but yeah, that's one of the most exciting ways to trap birds. Um, goose banding, we also conduct goose banding in the summer. Geese actually go flightless in the summer when typically when their um, goslings have hatched. And so the adults can't fly. So we basically build this big pen here and then we just kind of herd them in like cattle. Um, is how I can describe it the best. This is another video. So this is a small pond here up in the North country um, on a dairy farm. And basically um, we push all the birds in the water and we surround the pond with people. And then we'll put a bunch, a couple kayaks or canoes in and um, then the birds, you know, we'll just push them up. It's like we're ranchers on Yellowstone bringing the cows to the pasture, but we're trapping geese. So here's another video to see how that works. And there's actually a man in the water. This is not a goose over here that looks giant. That's a person. We had a little issue over here. So he just jumped in the water and saved our whole capture. So as you can see, they obviously wanna, you know, get away from the people in the kayak. So they're walking up and they'll go into this corral and um, we can trap them in that way. And goose week is always um, the end of June when it's like 90 and pure humid. So it is kind of nice when you have to jump in the water sometimes because <laughs> it's very hot. So once we get them in there, um, we band all the goslings and the geese. Um, every bird band has a unique size for the species. So um, we band each bird with a unique number and the correct size for that species. And then once they all have bands, they're sent on their way and they just now have a little, little bracelet on. So it doesn't harm them. I mean, they obviously get stressed, but um, we get a lot of information from them. Other work we conduct at Fish and Game, um, we have 48 waterfowl management areas where hunters can go and and duck hunt or goose hunt, geese hunt. Um, and so we manage the water levels to try to provide good brood rearing habitat and good quality food. Um, we also have a lot of surveys we conduct. Um, currently in the spring, we do a lot of breeding, waterfowl plot surveys all around the state. We go out and we, we see what kind of duck species are nesting in different habitats. Uh, we also do a woodcock singing ground survey where we go out at night and we listen for the painting of the woodcock. I'm sure you've all heard about that and their cool aerial dance that they do. Um, and then as I alluded to before, um, we do this nest box program for wood ducks and hood and mergansers. Um, we also acquire 
you know, a bunch of new land, um, fish and game has a, a lot of wildlife management areas. You can go and hike or, um, do various outdoor activities. We also conduct research to learn more about various duck species or geese species in the state. Um, currently we're involved in a very large collaborative mallard research project. And so um, we're attaching these little GPS satellite backpack transmitters onto hen mallards. And we're targeting hen mallards only because um, the mallard population in the Northeast US is declining. And we're trying to figure out why, whereas the subpopulation in Canada is stable. So we're tagging birds in Canada and the Northeast US and trying to see, um, we're gonna be able to decipher their different breeding parameters. Um, you know, are our, our birds in Northeast US just disturbed way more by humans? Um, are there more predators than there are in Eastern Canada? So we're gonna be able to learn a lot from this. So these are actually the current backpack. Every pin you see here is actually one of these birds. Um, so it's very cool to see. Um, this is was taken today. This is the most up-to-date. So you can see a lot of these birds has pushed north. These South Carolina birds are up here in the Great Lakes. Um, you have some birds from North Carolina and Virginia that are going up into New York and Pennsylvania. Um, really cool this morning. We had a New Hampshire bird. We have seven transmitters out in New Hampshire. We had three mortalities, unfortunately. But one of the birds this morning in like six, seven hours flew to New Brunswick this morning. Um, stopped a few times along the way in Maine. Um, but that was super cool. I checked this morning and I was like, oh my gosh. So she's she's headed up there to find a nest. And you know she probably does that every year. She probably has a they often go back to their same nest, nest sites. So um, we, we fitted her with a backpack this winter during our normal winter banding operations. And so we'll be doing this project for the next four years. So we're gonna have 40 total transmitters on hen mallards in New Hampshire. So, but in total, there's gonna be like 2000 mallard units in this whole project. So it's really a really cool project to be a part of and, and we're gonna learn so much. So stay tuned to hear more about those results. Um, but as the uh, topic alluded to, uh, you know, um, waterfowl do pose a nuisance to humans, um, especially in lake areas. Um, they go along the beach and what goes in must go out. They eat a lot of food and so therefore they produce a lot of poop. Um, one to two pounds of feces per day um, it, it's everywhere. I mean, there's really no stopping it. Um, so, you know, we get a lot of calls during, during the spring and summer about these, these are resident, these are the resident population of Canada geese that I talked about earlier, how we have the two populations. These are the resident population of Canada geese. So we get so many calls that, um, God, 20 years ago, we started contracting with USDA Wildlife Services in order to help out with all these calls. Um, and they really have a lot of tools that they can lend out to landowners, provide to landowners, um, you know, bangers and screamers and stuff to help um, with these birds. But, you know, ultimately we do have to learn to live with wildlife. Um, there's also a website that um, you can go if you have any wildlife issues on your on your property. Um, you can type in what is going on and you'll get a list of critters it may be um, and then give you pictures to try and help you figure out what the critter is. Um, but ultimately, you know, Canada geese and um, shoreline homeowners just don't get along. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do um, to try and mitigate issues with geese if you live on a lake. Um, you can modify the habitat. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't like to hear this, but you know, you can you can let 
the shoreline grass grow up and allow shrubs to grow. Um, but people, you know, like to mow right down to the shoreline um, so they can just go right into the water and have a better view. Um, but that's really just a highway for geese. Um, they really like that gradual shoreline to go up and then just the expansive lawn. You can also, you know, break up the expansive lawn and plant shrubs and trees in the middle um, because if they have obstructions, they don't feel as comfortable because they cannot see predators coming from a long distance. Um, yeah, you can minimize the use of fertilizer. Hopefully people who live on lakes are doing so anyway to, to reduce the nitrogen loading in lakes. Um, you can also install fencing, which is often problematic in lakes because you have to do it around the shoreline. Um, but it, it's very effective if you do it around ponds. There's also visual scare tactics, um, noise makers, bangers and screamers, and dogs actually work very effectively, border collies. Um, people have border collies that, that go out and haze the geese. So a lot of these tactics you can really only do before they start nesting. So you really wanna get on the problem right away when they, when they come back in the spring. And you just wanna let them know that it's not safe to be there immediately and you just have to be very diligent. So with that, um, I will take any questions that we have in the chat. Um, okay, thanks, Jessica. Let's, um, we don't have any questions yet, but I'm sure people will probably start typing stuff in now that they know that it's question time, but we did have a comment that I wanted to bring up. Um, and someone, uh, let's see, Therese said that can Canada geese can transport the fruit of the water chestnut, an invasive aquatic plant. And so I didn't know if there was anything that you knew that you could maybe add to that to talk about how birds could possibly transport invasive species. Yeah, I mean, not just Canada geese, any bird species that goes around a lake can, can transport invasive species. I mean, it just, it's not just Canada geese. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then let's see here. Okay. So we don't have any other questions, but I had a question for you. Um, you know, at, at New Hampshire lakes, we talk a lot about fertilizers and you had mentioned that about how they're bad for the lakes because they can cause cyanobacteria blooms. I don't know if the um, feces from these geese, does that also carry a lot of phosphorus? Is that also causing cyanobacteria blooms in areas where there are a lot of birds hanging out? Um, I don't know if it causes cyanobacteria blooms. Um, I would think that would be more linked to the, the um, fertilizer, but I'm not sure. I know their feces, you know, has, can carry parasites and, um, you know, duck species in particular, if you have a lot of ducks hanging out um, around your dock and stuff, um, can cause duck itch, swimmers duck itch. Um, but I'm not sure if it can affect the whole cyanobacteria blooms. I would have to look into that. Okay. Let's see what else is up here. Uh, Patricia is asking if you can review the ducks we are likely to see on New Hampshire's lakes during the summer. Sure. Um, it would be mallards, black ducks, hooded mergansers, common mergansers, um, red-breasted mergansers, Canada geese, wood ducks, you would see wood ducks. Great. Um, yeah, and then Sydney asked the same question. I think we just went over, do they contribute to cyanobacteria? So that's something we'll have to look into. Yes. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Patricia is asking, is there anything being done or that can be done to reduce the population of the Canada geese, like birth control even? Yeah, um, so Canada geese are a game species. They, we have um, a special season um, from September 1st to September 25th. 
um, where you can, if you buy a hunting license and a waterfall duck stamp in New Hampshire, um, you can harvest five resident Canada geese. Um, so it is quite a lot. And that is to help reduce all these nuisance conflicts uh, with the public. So that's the whole intent of the September season um, to reduce the resident goose population. Um, we could increase the bag limit more, but we do have a resident goose management plan that we follow. And we're kind of hovering right along the goal of, you know, stakeholders that want to view geese and also hunters that want to harvest geese to utilize. Um, so we're hovering right around that management population management goal. So, um, you know, we don't feel at this time we're going to increase the bag limit because um, five birds, you know, is a, is a lot of geese in one day. So yeah, we, we have a, a hunting season for them. Okay. Um... Sydney is asking, but how can you shoot in a populated area on a small lake? Yeah, that's the thing. You have to follow, you have to follow all the rules um, from hunt for all the, all the rules of carrying a fire, you know, shooting a firearm within 300 feet of a road and all, you have to follow all of those. So in the populated areas, that's, that's, the difficulty. Um, so there are other programs with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, you can get, um, if you find their nest, you can get an egg addling permit to addle their eggs um, to, to stop the growth of the population. Um, but I mean, the geese do fly off. So hunters are very good at, at you know, patterning them to see where they fly out of the populated areas, but once hunting season does start, they sort of do know where to go to, you know, not get shot at. So uh -huh. that's the tricky part with the hunting season, trying to target those, you know, really populated areas where you really can't legally shoot. So yeah. <laughs> Um, we do have some questions coming in now. So Nancy is asking, is there ever an issue with food supply? Food supply for waterfall? I'm guessing that's what she means. No, I mean, they, there's an abundance of food out there for the most part. Um, you know, they, they do utilize farm crops too. So we have nuisance complaints with farmers. Um, no, they really are very good at finding food and we never, you know, have had any instances where we've had a large die off of ducks because they're starving, for example. So, okay. There's plenty of food out there for them. Um, let's see here. Kim is asking, yes. what is the relationship between swans and the Canada geese? Are fake swans an effective deterrent? Fake swans are not an effective deterrent. They have not been shown to be an effective deterrent. Um, they just don't end up caring about them, especially if you're not moving them around. They don't really seem to care. Um, mylar, the special tape called mylar tape um, is way more effective than a swan decoy, for example. Um, you can kind of... Um, twist it around and tie it off on stakes. And so it'll move and it will also make a sound. As I said, you wanna have multiple strategies, not just one. Um, so that is kind of a good thing to do, the mylar tape as it is reflective and it, it makes, it shines off the sun and stuff. And so it um, is always constantly moving and then it as well in the wind, it'll make noise too. So it's, that's better a deterrent if somebody asks us about a swan decoy, we say, no, don't waste your money. Um, get it for the kids to, to <laughs> with, but don't get it to deter geese. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll let people um, see if anybody else has any questions here in the chat box for a few minutes. Um, I did want to just circle back to one of the things you said during the presentation about um, 
plant plantings on your shoreline to deter geese because that is certainly one of the things we recommend for um, Lake Smart uh, because okay. it because it helps reduce runoff. So having that green grass right down to the lakefront is not a good thing on for many reasons. Um, so it's nice to hear you mention that it can not only deter geese, but we also know that it can help reduce runoff, which is a great thing for our lakes. Yeah. I think we oh. missed a question earlier. Um, oh, great, uh, Gloria, Aaron. thank you. Yeah, Jan asked, uh, is there a restriction to where you can hunt the geese? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you would just have to refer to the hunting digest. Um, but typically, um, you know, you don't want to be near houses, anywhere near houses. You, a lot of times people hunt re resident geese in, in corn fields or green fields. They set up for them with, you know, you have to have a lot of decoys. Um, and if you're hunting sort of an ag field, but you can hunt marshes. Um, we have a lot of waterfowl management areas that I spoke of where you could hunt them with a few floating decoys. Um, so there's numerous places. Yep. And if you have any questions about where you could hunt them, you could always call the fish and game office and we would, we would help you with that. Great. We have Bob Shaw here with us tonight. One of our board members, Bob, did you have a question? I do. Uh, Jessica, uh, last year we had a, uh, resident couple of uh, Canada geese and, and sure enough, they bred and they had a half a dozen or more little goslings trailing around behind them for several days after they emerged from wherever they were nesting, which we never did discover. And then all of a sudden, the next day, there were no goslings. I mean, literally overnight, they all disappeared. And okay. that led me to wonder what is the mortality rate among these, the, 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 the lake uh, species, not just Canada geese, but, but the McGansers and the, and the mallards and, and the wood ducks and so on. I mean, it, that was just astonishing to me that, there, that this huge brood of little geese uh, literally disappeared. disappeared. We've got to assume they were predated. I don't, I don't know what else would have caused that to happen. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of predators going after these guys. We don't have specific data where I could say, you know, on lakes, it's X percentage. Um, but typically, um, with geese, it's about 40 to 60 percent um, survival of the of the gosling. So really, I mean, it, it depends on where they nest too. usually. Um, the adults try and keep them in a big expansive green area where they can see predators for miles when they're feeding. Um, so, I mean, they could have been, you know, first year um, breeders, just not really experienced. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say a number of things could have went on. So well, that, this was a rare specific a mortality rate though for, you know, lake nesting waterfowl. Unfortunately, we don't have that level of data. I see. Well, yeah. they do for the loons. I mean, they watch that very, very carefully. Oh them. yeah, the loons are a threatened species. So they watch every nest and they know every single. <laughs> we were to do that for waterfall. Oh my God, these things nest in <laughs> places. We would never yeah. be able to do that. We would need like hundreds of biologists. And so there's, just one. there's just one waterfall biologist. So I can't be out <laughs> monitoring productivity in every nest of waterfall in the state. All right, well, thank you. I could, trust thank you. Me. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, we do have another question in here that's kind of interesting. Um, Elizabeth is asking, do any of the waterfowl eat milfoil, which we know is an aquatic invasive species? Yeah, no, I don't believe they do. Um, they might inadvertently when they're eating something else, but no, unfortunately, they do not eat milfoil. Oh, that's too bad. I mean, I, I guess know. that that's one of the reasons why it's invasive, right? It doesn't have a lot of exactly. things that are eating it and that's how it gets out of control. So that would make sense. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, I don't see any other questions coming in here in the chat box. We have lots of great presentations and thank yous. So I do want to say thank you again for joining us. Um, I always see those 
cute little ducks out there this time mm -hmm. of year. So it's nice they to adorable. know some of the names and what they're all going through. Um, yeah. So thanks again. And I just want to let our viewers know that we will have our uh, recording and the slide presentation up on our website uh, tomorrow. Um, so you can share that with friends if they weren't able to join us this evening and go back and take a look for yourself as well. So thanks again, Jessica. I'm so happy you were able you. to join us. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye.